Good morning, and uh, welcome to the uh, very first financial services uh, uh, symposium. Uh, my name is uh, Kumar Baskaran. I actually lead the financial services research in IBM Research, and I'm also chair for the financial services symposium. This is the very first time we're having this um, in IEEE. Um, how fitting it's happening in Milan, where it's the financial capital of Italy. So. I want to first thank the University of Milan for uh, hosting this session here uh, in the beautiful campus and this uh, wonderful space where we are all uh, brought together to discuss um, um, research and development and challenges in the finance industry. Um, also kudos to the IEEE organizers. Um, health and wealth are matters of concerns for practically all of us around the world. Um, so it, it makes a lot of sense for IEEE to focus on um, health as well as the finance industry for the very first time starting in 2019. And we really thank the IEEE organizers uh, for having the vision to start that and engaging the largest technical professional community there is. So this is really very good news. Um, so a round of applause for IEEE and University of Milan. So, uh, you know, as um, uh, scientists um, um, and engineers, whenever we get into a new topic, the very first thing you want to do is, you know, set the system context, right? So what are we talking about when we talk about financial services? It need not be abstract. We are all uh, experiencing financial services in our daily lives. A simple way to think about it is, uh, you know, the segments that are shown here, um, on the screen, which is basically, Natalie, welcome. Yes. No worries, thank you. So uh, a simple way to look at finance industry is, um, segment-wise, is banking, uh, financial markets, and insurance, and there are many financial entities under each one of those. Now, just to put your heads around this, right, what is roughly the scope and size of the financial services um, industry we're talking about? Now, a simple way, again, to, to uh, uh, understand this is think of the world economy. That's roughly about $80 trillion. 3.25 times that, roughly about $262 trillion, is what financial service, services intermediates in a year between people and companies who actually want to invest, sources of funds, and people and companies who want to use those funds. And out of that intermediation, which is done by all these entities across these different segments, you know, $5 trillion of revenue is generated per year. Now you might be thinking, you know, let's break it down. Where does this $5 trillion go? I mean, I just want to give you a rough sense of it. So, you know, uh, all of us are very familiar with the retail sector of financial services because we walk into branches and we deal with banks and insurance companies and so on. The retail sector of financial services is roughly about a third of that revenue, slightly more than a third of that revenue. Then you've got the um, corporate and commercial side of financial services that provides a lot of the funds for growth for the, for the corporations and so on. That's about another third, slightly less than a third, right? Then you've got asset investment, wealth management, and you put payments together. That's the remaining third. So that's sort of roughly the scope of the financial services. So as you can see, the financial services industry is fairly broad, which is why you see in front of us a fairly large panel of experts, right? And we wanted to bring in practitioners from academia and industry, representing both business and technology perspectives, as they all have to come together, and also the view of fintechs, as well as you know, the more established enterprises within the financial services. So we've tried to balance all of that in the, um, in, in the panel. And so the way we are going to run the panel is each of the panelists will get about three minutes, three to five minutes tops to actually um, introduce themselves and also share their point of view. And, and they are the uh, folks who are in the field actually working on a lot of the various challenges that the industry faces. So you will hear from them first. And after that, we're going to sort of mix it up, as we say in the US, 
where you know we uh, actually will have a lot of questions, some coming from me on your behalf, uh, and uh, also interactions among the panelists. So that's how we're going to run this. So with that, uh, we're going to, uh, these are the panelists that uh, we're going to be um, talking to. So we'll start first with Natalie. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Perfect. I'm on. Um, so first of all, thank you for the invitation. I'm so honored to be uh, with you guys, uh, Kumar, and, and the panel together. A little bit about what I'm, what I'm doing. Um, I'm right now in, in a number of initiatives. Most of them are uh, going around the world. Um, right now, I'm in Latin America. Right now, we're going to spend with my team some time in Europe to really take a, um, you know, a real sense of what's going on with blockchain, but not isolated, but in a number of other applications, especially in fintech, financial inclusion, and a number of things. About my background, I started with blockchain um, uh, when I was at, at MIT. I'm still related to them through the Inter-American Development Bank. We're working use cases on blockchain. Uh, with these uh, organizations, and the idea there is to have um, the rigorosity of the academic side combined with the actual implementation through governments with the, with the multilateral organizations. So that's, um, that's something I've, I've been doing lately. Uh, my background is I'm a systems engineer. Um, I was born in Rensselaer, Peru. Then I spent time in banks in, in Latin America at Goldman Sachs after that. So with that um, um, you know, background on, on finance and, and insurance, I um, then after focus more about on, on technology, I spent some time at Microsoft. And so I tried to put out all that together to really bring these really use cases and really, uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, so you can see there's a lot of uh, going, uh, things going on on FinTech. Well, the panelists will, will talk about that, especially for blockchain. There's a, a current ecosystem. So there's uh, things around uh, financial payments, uh, settlements, transparency. Um, some of them are ap applied to financial institutions as they are right now. So banks and, and you know, um, insurance. But then there's other disruptors. So we're going to talk about a little bit more about that because disruption comes from both the startups the fintechs they call, you know, the startups focused into fintech, but also from, um, also, you know, governments and, and so on, but also from people. So we're going to talk, when we talk about blockchain, we're going to talk about people, how, how blockchain empowers people to get things done as well, to make themselves uh, in, included financially by themselves. So as, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm doing a, a lot of, um, you know, um, field work in terms of identifying those use cases. So that's what we'll do with the blockchain challenge and with all these organizations I mentioned before. I think I didn't send that much, right? It's fine? Yeah, okay, that's good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next we have Christoph. Hello, I'm Christoph. I come from France and uh, right now I work for a company called Credendo, who's a hundred years old insurance company out of Belgium, uh, who is in the field of export credit agency, as you may know. There is an export credit agency in most of the countries helping companies of this country to export while not facing the risks of non-payment from the buyer in the overseas country. Now, this, this industry within financial services is called credit insurance. And in a way, it's helping companies to get paid in B2B trade with credit without the risk of not being paid if the buyer defaults, goes bankrupt, between the time he gets the goods or he gets the services and the time he's supposed to pay. And the problem is that credit insurance has been the same for the last 50 years or so. It's been quite successful, but as most of you probably don't know credit insurance, we can also say that it's been relatively unknown. And because it's so unknown, there's actually very few startups and very few innovators coming to this space. Now, it's still a very practical problem that a lot of economies face. How do you help your SMEs to do more business, to give more credit to their buyers when they don't know the credit worthiness of these buyers? So that's typically the challenge, the big fundamental challenge we're trying to solve. Helping SMEs, helping companies get credit or helping sellers give credit to their buyers. 
And because we don't think it's a problem we can solve on our own, we decided to launch an innovation ecosystem. And by launching this ecosystem, we believe we're gonna attract more parties around the table to solve this issue. And so for us, the, the innovations in FinTech are just a means to address a practical issue. An issue that, that may look very simple, but that has lots of intricacies. Can I present? Oh yeah, we're already on the next slide. So typically the kind of technologies or business models that we leverage to address those issues are more data and implementing AI in the science of trade credit, which can be done either on the insurance side or on the trade finance side. Typically, the business has been done so far by using financial statements of companies that are more than one year old. And so most of the companies who are insured are actually not represented by those financial statements because in one year, the situation can change a lot. So we're looking for ways around that to get access to fresh data and typically to incentivize companies to publish this data to trusted third parties that can then decide whether they should be granted credit or not. Marketplaces is the second aspect. With the first dimension, a very obvious one, marketplaces and marketplace operators in particular don't know the world of trade finance. So how do you leverage APIs or better designed products so that marketplaces like Alibaba, Amazon Business, etc., can embark the power of trade finance solutions and create insurance solutions. But the second aspect is the one that I'm mostly interested in these days, which is how do you use marketplace logics to help companies sell or buy credit risk data from other companies? How do you create a market for this very specific risk data that every company has in their banking system, in their CRM, in their accounting system, in order to unlock it and create a map in the world of where credit risk is. And third pillar is SMEs, as they are the direct beneficiary of that. How do you create solutions out of the marketplaces about data that you can leverage for that? And the last one is basically there is a fundamental trust issue whenever you are a company and you are unlocking access to your data. So how do you create systems so that even a hundred years old company like Credendo doesn't need to be trusted that it's gonna do what it says it will be doing? How do you basically leverage blockchain to solve entirely the fundamental trust issue that we are in? Thank you, Christoph. Ricardo. Hello, uh, my name is Ricardo Collado. I am uh, coming from academia. I'm a professor at Students Institute of Technology in Hoboken, uh, New Jersey. And um, what we are doing is that we are approaching difficult problems in which we are now facing with the fact that the technologies we have might not be the right one. So we said, okay, let's look into some other alternatives, and we are looking into quantum computing type of systems. Um, one, one of the things that we're doing is that uh, we have a Stevens uh, a Center for uh, Quantum Science and Engineering. Uh, Stevens traditionally is an engineering school, so we're very strong into that. And uh, this center has a few, uh, let's say, um, factions in a way. So there's the engineers, which they are developing technologies to, to do quantum. And then we have uh, another faction, which is a mixture of people from the business school, the financial engineering school, and the, also the physics department, in which we are developing algorithms and software based, or uh, I would say more like uh, algorithm based uh, solutions. And uh, in that space, we're dealing with different technologies. Uh, some of us are working on um, analog type of quantum systems, okay, like uh, it was mentioned before. And some others are working on a photon based uh, quantum systems. And uh, all of us are trying just to solve difficult problems. Okay. In my case, uh, we focus on uh, portfolio optimization problems. So we're looking into, at the moment, uh, they're not so big because of the constraints of the technology, but the idea is to be able, able to apply a risk averse optimization to huge problems uh, in, in uh, um, portfolios. And also, we would like to do similar uh, with uh, counterparty risk calculations. 
Now, the issue here is that many of these uh, things can be done now uh, with, with standard type of methods, but uh, in the introduction of risk aversion actually kind of breaks the, the, the mold that we have. Now, no longer these problems are easy to solve. Now we belong the, to a class of problems which are like very difficult to solve. And the standard methods we, we have uh, actually do not work that well. Turns out that quant computers can give us an, an edge on this. So that's what we're trying to exploit. And, and uh, we are making strides uh, on that. Um, and I hope that uh, if you guys have questions about this, I will be able to answer. Uh, one of the things that we, we're posing is that these systems that we're looking at today, already we can use them in, in applications. And in the future, it will really open uh, a lot of I mean, solutions to difficult problems that we cannot really consider right now. Uh, and think about being able to solve uh, uh, counterparty risk problems with thousands of, of uh, variables instead of just a few. And doing that immediately, well, well more or less, that's a, that's a promise. We might not be right at that now, but uh, we have to look forward. And uh, if we have these technologies, uh, specifically uh, quantum computers, the technologies become available in 10, 20 years. We have to start now, so when we get there, we, we are ready for it. So and that's what we are looking for. We're trying to develop all of the systems such that we're ready when these things uh, come by. Thank you, Ricardo. Emily. Hi, uh, this is Emily Liu. Uh, I'm also from Stevens Institute of Technology, just like uh, Ricardo. Uh, I'm an associate professor of information systems in the School of Business. Actually, I was a research scientist at IBM Research for many years. Uh, so right now I teach natural language processing and NLP at Stevens. Um, my research interest mainly about like fintech, about regulation technology, particularly actually I'm interested in applying the NLP techniques actually um, to actually to detect like the frauds or the insider tradings or the internal behaviors from the financial text. Um, and also, I get started on the uh, blockchain and IBM research, so I continue in that thread. Um, I think right now, I just wanted to, for the panel, I'd like to introduce a, a very interesting problem about the um, tax mining in the financial um, tax. Um, I think for the, in the United States, there's a rich data set, actually, as a financial disclosure. Um, probably, I think the largest directory uh, agency in the United States is the SEC, right? the Security um, and Exchange Commission. So every year, every public forum has to file the financial document or financial disclosure to SEC quarterly and annually. So this practice continued for 20 years. So you can think about like it's a large data set. Um, so and each document actually is really rich. It's average about like 10, I think 100,000 words. So a lot of uh, researchers in the finance or county or even economics actually, they have done a lot of interest studying in this area um, because the in the financial test, there's some unique um, ad uh, advantage. So typically, say we, if we analyze the financial, you think about the financial indicators like the numbers from the balance sheet. So those numbers more or less give you some kind of describe what has happened in the past. It's the ex post view of the business. But if you wanted to predict something, say the stock moment in the future, or you wanted to predict, say, if this company has some fraudulent behavior, then you have to have something called like X and T perspective of the business. But where can you get the data from um, from this perspective. So the financial disclosure actually give you this opportunity. Typically in this financial disclosure, there is a special section called MDA, the management analysis, uh, sorry, a management discussion and analysis. So the managers have to describe their business operations and also lay out their business plan. So this gives us a channel to understand what's going on and what will happen in the future. But unfortunately, everything is unstructured text. Okay, so that's basically in the past, actually, a lot of studies actually analyze the financial text. They try to use the um, information extracted from the financial text to understand, say, predict the stock moment 
once they predict whether there's some fraudulent activities, frauds, misconduct, etc. So that's basically a rich area for the FinTech and also for the directory technologies. Um, so if you have time, I can discuss more about this opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> Michael. Hi, I'm Associate Dean for Faculty and Research at Arizona State University. And there are two signs that I want to point to that uh, indicate to me that FinTech is about to completely and drastically change the world. This will probably be one of the most disruptive technologies to commerce that we've seen. The first data point that I have is our finance professors in the business school are among the highest paid. And as of late, I'm seeing them carrying around machine learning textbooks. They want to know it. They need to learn it and, and become aware of what's happening. Uh, the second data point I'll, I'll mention is that we are now investing in algorithms. And with the advent of cryptocurrencies, basically people are putting money into their trust in an algorithm that will take care of their money. And, and if they feel that their trust is low, then of course the return has to be high to be able to create that investment. That's a whole new uh, way of thinking about these markets. And I've been interested in what this landscape uh, of FinTech is going to be and how uh, the different research uh, might be done in the different areas. So to that, I think there's going to be two big areas of research, one in FinTech and then also one in what's called RegTech, which uh, yesterday it was mentioned that the institutions and the ISO models have helped us do software engineering uh, practices in the past, there's nothing equivalent in the fintech world. So I think as, as service, service computing researchers, we can contribute to the reg tech as well as innovate new solutions in, in fintech. So how will that happen? Uh, one of the models that I've been considering is how medicine produces new research. So there are very scientific methods, I'll call that at the bottom layer here, our services computing science. And there's a translation that occurs from that science into theories and abstractions and designs. Those will probably occur on both directions, from the reg tech side and the fintech side. Those translations will probably be guided by a set of rigorous research methodologies that may be different and maybe somehow start to overlap. But both of those thrusts will probably be occurring. And as we see the papers mature and the research mature, we'll be able to classify them into those categories. But at one layer up, I see that this, uh, there's going to be a need for this applied fintech and applied reg tech, just like there are for clinical trials for new drugs that are created. And those clinical trials that we will do will require a different set of translations and a different set of research capabilities to be able to assess whether things are ready to move into this market. If we can't figure out the rigor to contribute our research in through these translations, I think we're stuck with a market in the middle of these two Venn diagrams that will uh, push back down and help us figure it out as the anomalies and the problems occur. There's lots of types of fintech to be created, some just to manage the ecosystem, some to help the managers that are trying to run fintech from day to day, whether it's insurance or banking or whatever. And then I think there's also this reg tech side that our governments and uh, our, our inter inst intergovernment institutions will need to help supervise this. Thank you. Michael, thank you. Jorge. Buongiorno. It's such or Italian. Uh, a pleasure to be with you. Let me just ignore this. Let me tell you that I worked half of my life in academia and the other half in industry research. The common denominator in the 30 years is that I worked on practical problems, applied work, uh, fundamentally in financial services and manufacturing, a little bit on telecom. So that's it, right? So let's, let's, let's go to the core story. Uh, if we go down, if you can page down, um, great. So, uh, you know, the financial services and IT industries traditionally have been on their own independent course, yeah? And uh, uh, do any of you work in financial services companies in the audience? No, right? So no one works in a bank, in a fund. Okay, good. So these two industries have had 
a long-standing uh, divergence in a number of ways. Uh, IT has been always a source of cost for financial services people. Um, the IT spending in finance services is the top across all the industries. In Europe only, just to give you an idea if you're not familiar with this, around 350 billion per year is what the financial services industry uses in IT. Okay, so uh, CS engineering, technology people, in general, the way we've been educated, I'm a computer science by education too, so uh, we, we, we don't quite understand financial services as it is, right? The competence is very well. So, so now then, what we are seeing today, and this is the good news about what we are trying to accomplish, right? This is great news for IEEE, for the industry, for people doing R&D, like all of us, right? Uh, I think there is, there is an opportunity, lifetime probably, that these two industries begin some convergence in agenda and uh, some convergence in uh, common capabilities, labor, uh, trends, so uh, that, is, that is legal as well. So this is, this is a very interesting moment that has begun somehow with the FinTech story, but I think it goes well beyond, right? Well beyond the FinTech story. The FinTech story, frankly, one may say that it's being resolved as expected after 15, 10 years by seeing most of the acquisitions that you see happening in the market today is where banks and big firms are taking care of the value from the fintech industry, right? Uh, for, for the most part. So let me go into uh, some recommendations. This convergence is about getting out of the conventional rat hole in which IT has been in the financial services industry. From a source of unfortunate cost, <laughs> moving it to a source of value, creation and differentiation for the financial services companies, regulators, and so forth, right? So very, very briefly, uh, digital platforms are cost-effective growth, right? So this is the foundation, it's the industry neutral, sandbox that most of us working in computing love, right? Like cloud, security, AI, a la carte. Yeah. So, but be prepared for the razor cost because everything that is foundational infrastructure for cost takeout, the financial services industry will continue to be implacable, right? So they, they will go by bottom line and so forth. Now moving the differentiation part, which is hopefully where we would see a lot more value creation. In my view, cognitive is key, and cognitive financial services competences, in my experience, after working with banks, funds, asset managers for about 15, 20 years, I, I have not seen any of these capabilities to be sort of industry neutral, forming some form of cognitive middleware that then, on top, we would personalize by uh, using use cases or, or, or things like that. In my view, it's, it's the experience. This is an experiential sharing. It's not theory, it's different, right? So I believe we need to design a financial services cognitive utility, which is scalable. It would be used, obviously, by any bank, for example, but it needs to be understood in the concert of the core competencies of the industry, right? And there are industry competencies that you cannot go one by one because it would take a full day to understand minimally what they mean, what they are, what their requirements are. So just in closing, uh, one more differentiation, which is the issue of a scale, right? IT industry needs scale, and the industry of financial services scalability is completely different. Right? So there are two different scales. So the good point is that if a cognitive utility could be made real by hitting it the right thing that finance services people want, I believe the scalability is ensured. For example, in banks, you will have easily, every bank would adopt that, which is a phenomenal volume, potentially. 
Okay, so if you go down in the transactional enterprise, in my view, dragging the top value into commodity platforms is going to be a very questionable case-by-case -case cost analysis that the financial services industry leaders will make. Right? So the judge is out, the jury is out, right? The judge will say, and, and obviously the judge is, is done, right? Thank you, Ulrich. Ah, one more, thank you. No, no, let me make that point, if you don't mind. Yeah. Let's watch out the legal issues in Europe, particularly. Europe is trending something which I believe is fundamental that we need to understand, cope with, and work in the conditions that we see societally. Uh, let's watch out. No, this is not GDPR. This is a lot deeper than GDPR. GDPR addresses the issue of privacy. Here, what I'm talking about is the legal or illegal nature of automatic decision making in the eye of whatever the European Union is regarded as a citizen right. So let's watch out because the type that is just the tip of the iceberg what we've seen in uh, GDPR. There is a lot more coming and may render most of the work that we are doing illegal if it's not done properly. So this is a big flag from a legal perspective that informs, I believe, a responsible applied research agenda. Okay? Thanks. Thank you. Sorry for the... No, thank you, Ray. Wrong. Hi. Um, I'm Rong Chen. I'm um, honored to be one of the about 800 members of IBM Academy of Technology, focus on advocating and uh, promoting business-aligned IT. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank IEEE Computer Society uh, community for giving me uh, various important roles in serving the community in the R&D areas I have a passion for. So the topic I would like to uh, share with you uh, is uh, titled I API Economy and the Market Cloud. Uh, the central thing of this topic is actually about ease of consumption of everything we do. Like just Catherine, the, the keynote uh, talk about is a great uh, era we are living in in terms of a number of new technology innovation we are seeing and experiencing. On the other hand, one of the big challenges of really benefit from all the technologies is about cons consumability. Okay, now, from the business viewpoint, it's very important to make the technology easy to consume, both to both the consumer of the business as well as the business itself. So that's the thing of this one. Then we think, the API services provides a very appealing solution to this challenge. That's why you see on the right-hand side, I titled uh, a design dimensions with service-first um, architecture decision dimensions for enterprise API services. Now, why we talk about enterprise API services, you see the, the bullet on the left-hand side, uh, putting short, it's a very big market, that's good. That means we, have a, we are not short of a financial support for doing the work in this area, right? And the second is a real business needs. As I said, uh, based on the survey, we see their uh, external APIs and connected call. In case you don't know, the connected call really means connect to IBM Z based capabilities, okay? Those are the top two uh, company uh, priorities. Uh, and the way that the people have envisioned, even from the big enterprises in the globe, have been saying, saying one of the most promising approach would be using the API-based approach to integrate all the technology and capability together with, the, with those two kind of big requirements in mind. And um, my PhD thesis is about digital computing. Uh, around the 90s, we have the logo, say we are going to make the mainframe as a dinosaur in Europe. We are the new king. 
And over the years, my respect for IBM mainframe Z has been keep growing. And then for the financial service, I understand even in my lifetime, well, I will see CZ keep growing exponentially, okay? I want to bring your attention on there. So don't focus just on X. If you like to really understand what the industry needs, spend more time on Z applications and what Z can do for you. And last but not least, I want to mention that is the ecosystem is very important. And when we think about ecosystem, don't just think about external. For the internal companies, that's also a big challenge. Many banks, uh, they are also struggling how they streamline their internal operations and reducing their internal operating cost through the API services. So when we think about the API services, we have to think about the private also. That's even more important than the public. The last but not least, I want to mention again the, the diagram I put on the right hand side. That's really think about a, enterprise API services. Not just saying that you develop a rest of server code, for example, you deploy a web server, or you just deploy a container-based you know, images running in the Kubernetes. That becomes a service that people can consume. That is not an enterprise API services we'll talk about. That's your POC or your demo stuff. When we talk about enterprise you know, API services, that be, must be manageable. That we call operational surf support services and management business support services. Those are the very enterprise fundamental requirement from the service management viewpoint. Another point I want to mention is that the DevOps. I personally view that the DevOps is actually the driver for the current era of innovation. Okay, some people call the software service engineering or service software engineering. And we even have a tutorial you know, on the first day of the conference talk about that. That's actually fundamental changes how we build our services and make them improve in, uh, incrementally in an agile manner. So we can talk more about these six dimensions later, not even offline. But that's what I want to share with, the, with you on the, this topic around API economy and money crowds. Um, that's it. Wrong, thank you very much. So we've now heard from all our panelists. You can see, you know, we have a very broad and, and diverse panel. Um, and it's very well represented globally as well. And that's what it takes to solve financial services problems in many ways, right? You've got to have these very diverse points of view. Now we're going to get into a little bit of Q&A to dig deeper into uh, the expertise that they bring here to inform us as to what's happening in the financial services space, all looking towards the future. So I know that, uh, you know, I want to start really at the point where, um, you know, the, the top line of the financial services, where people are looking for new sources of revenue, new profit pools. You know, I've, let me start with what I call new models of trust. And I'm going to start with um, uh, Natalie and Christoph, starting with Natalie, because we talked about blockchains and ecosystems. So Natalie, you know, on the, on the blockchains, it's very clear that it's very much in the press. Um, you know, quoting Accenture, uh, you know, 90% of the banks in, in the US um, as well as in the EU are all exploring blockchain, right? And I saw a, a news article from Davos as well saying 40 central bankers all exploring blockchains as well, right? So, and, and there's quite a bit of money being pumped into blockchains, let's face it. Just the financial services sector alone, half a billion dollars, right? Conservative estimate. So expectations are riding quite high. Now you're out there right in the field, you know, helping companies and others form blockchains and practical solutions as senior technical architect and evangelist. What do you see, is blockchain, is blockchain going to live up to the expectations? Or is it a lot of hype? Can I tell you, it's, it's um, right now it's hype because you know, when you adopt something and you adopt it because it, it's a promise, like, um, you know, banks, especially retail banks, that they have a lot of ledgers and legacy. <clears throat> so um, they have all these ledgers. They want to do reconciliation settlement inside the bank and outside the bank, right? You've seen um, most of the banks that are running right now, they still have a lot of legacy. They have the ledger separated. You pay your credit card, you don't see the balance right away. Those reconciliations going, and it's getting worse because all the batch, you know, routines over the night, they never end. So that's, legacy is there, 
And it, I like what Jorge and, and Ron mentioned because even if you put APIs on top of that, you still have the capabilities on the legacy. Uh, or you put ne a new capability, but it's based on somewhere there's a legacy around supporting that. That is made in COBOL or Assembler or you know this mainframe that you have there. So of course you cannot change that. You, blockchain certainly brings um, you know um, some um, relief in terms of agility, but blockchain itself is not as you know these big ledgers. You cannot put everything on blockchain. It's not as scalable. It's not designed for that. It's to put a little bit of information that can be shared and that can be traceable and that can you do. Because um, the way it's designed, you agree before writing, you don't reconcile after, right? Yeah. So, so, so that's good, but you cannot put a lot of things there because that way to, you know, to do the agreement uh, is not scalable uh, at all right now, right? And probably there's, there's a way to do it uh, after. So that's, that's, what, that's why a number of platforms are going to the corporate side. Um, um, one of them that started years ago this, there's this protocol named Corda uh, on this um, consortium named R3. The, most of the banks are there. There's other, you know, um, more, less, um, um, you know, um, type of Bitcoin emerging, like this come from a paper. It's not like, is it like corporate ready or not because of the regulation, it needs to scale a number of things. So there's this, some, some group of people that they started putting these solutions corporate ready. So those are the ones that, uh, in my opinion, are gonna go to solve some of those problems, but the structural problem behind that on the operational side, reduce cost, legacy, is a, that's a lot of cost. So probably that won't get there as it promised because there's other uh, things you know, so, stopping that. But Natalie, what are some of the interesting examples that you're currently working on and what mm -hmm. do you see real benefits coming out of that? So, and the other thing is, um, the, I, I was on, on this, um, you know, um, test among some banks, they started to do transfers without SWIFT. You know, SWIFT takes, <laughs> takes an, an, um, you know, a piece on that, and then they started doing transfer because they were part of this consortium. So they see, okay, this is working. It's called, because I put a note, so it's, it wasn't costly or, or difficult to get into this. And I started doing this, and then they said, but is it really adding value? Like, I just, I'm saving a million dollars a year. For a bank, a million dollars is nothing, right? A million dollars you can sell, yeah, if you negotiate with IBM or Microsoft, you can save, save $10 million on the desk. So, um, so it's like, okay, is it worth to keep this operating? Is the TCO for that is going, it's not the time because I need at least 55 banks on this consortium to really be cost effective. So it's a matter more of adoption rather than, because they're waiting orders to get into the consortium, what consortium I'm gonna join in Spain, there's this beautiful consortium, I don't know how many companies are there. So this is more about adoption, it's like internet, right? You have like three points, there's no adoption, it's not worth, but it's more about that. So whenever I talk to banks, the other thing is, um, as, as I think you mentioned Jorge before, uh, it's more about the, how we spend in IT instead of having the banks or financial institutions being technology companies. Right now, they are. So when they don't change that mindset, probably it's, it's more about that rather than blockchain itself. We have a number of things, blockchain. Um, you know, we've, I've been working with but data lakes. They're amazing. You can do a lot of things, but if they don't adopt that on the right way and they're really committed to, okay, we're gonna get, uh, the other thing is, in, in terms of blockchain, you need to share your benefits. And banks are not used to that, right? I'm the first one, I'm the first mover, I'm gonna maximize my, my gains, but then if I need to share that because, because I'm in the consortium, I need to collaborate with my partners. Yeah, okay, I can do that if that's, I mean. Same with, um, yeah, same with, with other applications that they need, not only financial institutions, but they need to be in the consortium to do to do things. Yeah, so there's still a lot of practical and operational challenges when it comes to mm -hmm. Yeah, in terms blockchain. of landing that and, and, and making uh, companies be early adopters to have one or two or three or four years of, you know, putting efforts and then really yeah, gather the, the gains of that. Yeah, but in terms of looking ahead into the future, mm -hmm. um, what are one or two things we ought to be watching for in this space? So. So right now for financial institutions, rather than being um, 
you know, customer facing, that's, that's the, other, the other challenge, right? When you uh, pitch something or convince some people that you're gonna uh, make some savings or something hidden on the back is gonna give you some benefit, it's super difficult to put together um, a business case. It's difficult, more difficult than say, okay, I'm, I'm, instead of having one million customers, we're gonna have 50, and uh, so we're gonna have, you know, the number of transactions and, and fees and whatever. So it's more difficult to put together a business case. So in the future, definitely, uh, once the adoption is there, all the settlement part <clears throat> or reconciliation part is, uh, is key. It, that's, 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 that's number one. That, that's something that is, is, it's been a pain for, for banks and financial institutions for years. Like, I mean, most of us, <laughs> I think we've seen that. And it's, it's difficult. I, and once you see how it works, it's like, this is not, should be working like that. It's like impossible to, to maintain that. So that, that part is core, that part is already tested, and that part is already working. And in terms of trans, uh, transfers, for instance, SWIFT already, they decided, okay, we are uh, we're gonna be away if we wait a little bit more. So they started doing POCs with blockchain to help the banks adopt that. So they, what they're doing is they're destroying value to get new value. I don't know what their uh, new business model is going to be, but at least they're there and they're not missing what, what's going on. So we, we see SWIFT, we see the central banks also adopting. Um, I think regulations right now, they're getting faster there. There's a lot, a lot of things, a lot of things to, to do, but you know, yeah. governments at least, they're paying attention. Right now they're, they're, uh, they're trying to to make things not you know, constrained, but at least to have a little bit of control of what's going on. So everything is converging right now. I think in two, two or three years, uh, <clears throat> there's gonna be a better adoption. You, you can see some numbers like, okay, the ROI, the return of my investment was actually this. Yeah. Right now, it's more of investment. Well, thank you. I think um, uh, you said it well, so, but it sort of leads and segue into the what Christoph was mentioning, right? Mm -hmm. Blockchains in some ways have helped catalyze ecosystems and, and um, Christoph touched on what Area 42 is trying to reimagine uh, trade finance. Um, so, but Christoph, I think it'll be very helpful for the audience because I keep hearing the word ecosystem being used, you know, uh, so often. Let's actually, you know, put some framework around this, right? In my mind, I mean, just borrowing something from HBR, on one end of the spectrum is you've got a vertically integrated enterprise. And on the other end of the spectrum, you've got a totally fluid open market. Ecosystem is somewhere there in between, but closer to the, to the marketplace. Is that a good, good way to understand ecosystem? How are you looking at ecosystems? What are some of the interesting things happening in um, you know, what the areas that you mentioned? I think it's a great way of defining an ecosystem where it's a fuzzy thing where organizations collaborate and build a sort of meta-organization that has joint interests. And coming back to this notion of blockchain and is it, is it, are we in a fashionable time or not? There's clearly a fashion about that, but I think there's also in the recent weeks, there has happened something huge, which is Facebook launched Libra. And for me, this is an ecosystem play that piggybacks on the technology that's been around for 10 years or so and where most of the financial services players have been playing the evolutive game so far, have not really gone back to the blank sheet of paper. Some have tried, but, but not many have. And it's interesting because right now, it might strongly accelerate the two to three years adoption timeframe that you mentioned by putting a huge pressure, not only on the banks, but also on the central banks. Well, like, oh shit, but I didn't expect that to happen at all, and now I've got a private company, and moreover one who can be criticized for his handling of data, that can actually handle much bigger amounts of money, financial flows, etc., than regulated organizations. And uh, the reason why Libra sort of was considered seriously is because it is, in a way, an ecosystem play. It is very driven by Facebook, who put all the engineering behind that and, and some sort of ambassador play, etc. But because they presented it as something that is backed by a number of organizations to reach this $1 billion balance sheet kind of threshold, it doesn't look like it's just Facebook. And therefore, it is relevant. Therefore, it reaches a sort of consensus and looks legitimate for adoption later. 
So that's sort of the way we look at the ecosystem ourselves. It's both to infuse ideas that we would never have had ourselves, but then to create immediately a path for adoption that goes beyond the simple resolution of a technical case. So it's clearly a multi-actor, uh, multi-directional relationship yes. between entities within an ecosystem to create value, which no single firm would have been able to create, right? And so what's, what's some of the innovative things that Area 42 is coming up with? So the, the biggest challenge that we're trying to crack right now, and there's a number of other ones and sometimes more challenging we'd like to do in the future, but the biggest one we try to do today is to, to find the business model that would incentivize SMEs in several countries, if possible, to share access to their banking, CRM, accounting data in order to to solve the financial inclusion, inclusion problem that they mm. have. And this problem is a, is a tough one because, I mean, just in APAC, for example, the reports say that it's a, it's a several trillion dollar problem each year, and this is hindering the economies of, of those countries. Now, we cannot just simply say, well, give me the data and I'm gonna tell you how much credit you should get. It, it, it needs to create an ecosystem where there are players who incentivize those SMEs to share the data. There are other players who build models to interpret this data. And there are other players who are just watching things to remain a safe environment where there is no competitive position abuse or there is no competitor of this company who then finds logic to get access to data they should not get access to. And um, we think that just uh, an insurance company cannot solve that. We think it's necessarily an industry-wide issue. Now, most of our industry, unfortunately, is focusing on evolutive moves. Yeah. So that's why we're reaching out, reaching out to a sort of different approach to that, where we're saying, well, we don't really know what the different steps are to solve that, but we're exposing our plan, and, uh, and that's why I'm so excited to participate uh, today. We're exposing our plan, and we'd like a uh, suggestion for how best to take it forward. Yeah, thanks, Christoph. Um, Michael, um, now, Natalie and Gustav painted a picture of uh, how all these players would come together, create ecosystems, create new value uh, for the financial services industry. As we very well know, right, these all cross jurisdictions. Um, you know, the whole space of regulations comes into play. Um, so how do you see innovation happening in the, uh, in the rec tech space that you mentioned? So I, I think it's gonna be really interesting for our community uh, to look at what the governments are doing. So they're beginning to create sandboxes and inviting uh, uh, people in that are in the FinTech space to come and test the, their ideas out in these sandboxes under uh, some protected environment where the government can be engaged and kind of watch. So you'll see those in Singapore. I mean, my one state, my state in, in of Arizona and the U.S. has one of these sandboxes. Um, the EU has, uh, Britain has sandboxes. I think the EU is moving on. So engaging in, in working in these sandboxes to test this out, I think that's gonna be the global way to sort of configure this. But we're looking at an evolution over time for these regulations. And I, I hope that it isn't that we have to deal with the pain each time and then go figure that out, but right now, uh, the invitation is there for fintech innovators to work with government in these sandboxes. Yeah, also, Michael, I think, you know, you, you have made the point in, in, in some of uh, your writings, especially, of the distinction between not simply just automating processes, but also relationships yeah. between entities, right, where rec techs do need to consider that aspect in whatever intelligence they bring into that's right. I mean, I, I think, you know, we, we talk about just issues of collusion between companies, and that's, that's a perfect example of relationships that are very hard to detect right now in, in current fraud transactions. Uh, whether someone is playing together in an illegal way, you have to be very smart how to, figure, to place those algorithms. But I think there are other uh, use cases like, like supply chain where relationships are very important, and uh, maybe those will play a role in how reg tech will uh, fashion different solutions based on relationships. I noticed Jorge mentioned that he thought there would be a, a cognitive utility approach to this, and my thinking has often been a use case driven approach. 
And I think that the marriage of these two, as I've been sitting here, that, that really portends an exciting era for this, that if there are ways of thinking about cognitive computing for uh, crowdfunding, uh, you can use crowdfunding in supply chain, you could use crowdfunding of a bond for insurance, how, how do each of those then play into that, that financial milieu? And that's all based on relationships that are developed between different parties. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so wrong, I think, you know, um, um, when we look at the ecosystems and the regulations, um, at the end of the day, some transaction has to flow through, right? So how do these environments, which are most likely going to be hybrid cloud environments or multi-cloud environments, Oftentimes people talk about APIs and, and functional aspects of what something can do. But what about the non-functional aspects? Finance industry is heavily regulated at the same time, there's significant impatience for uh, systems that are poorly performing, right? So how do we handle non-functional requirements as well in considering what the systems should be and the evolution of those? Yeah. Thank you, yeah, yeah that's a good question. So. Yes, financial industry uh, spend a lot of money, much, much higher than their hardware cost, by the way, in regulation and compliance. Okay. Now, one thing people talk about API uh, to address problem is really at the two levels. The first is the API service itself. As we said, we have talked about the enterprise API services. So, Every API service imp design, implementation, deployment, and operation management need to address the issue we just talked about, right? How they got secure, how they manage your data, how they make sure their operating procedure satisfy the regulation and compliance requirement. So that's one. Now, when we talk about ecosystem, we cannot ask everybody to open their implementation as a white box and say, okay, let's do the all the evaluation from the ground up. Let's see your server, let's see your hard uh, firewall, let's impass us. So that's why we are advocating the service first approach. What that means is, supposing every individual enterprise API services can be managed based on the compliance regulation needs, then we have a strong foundation to build up another level of uh, compliance and the regulation management based on the individual API services. Then at that level, we are talking about the interaction of individually administered API services. Then we are starting paying attention to how they share their data. Very often people don't understand is, when we talk about API service, it's not just the operational aspect of the API, but also the data that the API operates on. That's why we talk about the telco company have the notion of a data plan and a control plan. You can think of the control plan is your API. The data is actually the different plan. So I think that's the missing piece that a lot of people have not spent enough effort working on. That is, supposing we already have individually administered API service that satisfy all the non-functional requirement. How can we build a composite API services in a way that all the data shared among all the services together can also be compliant. So that's how we think that uh, one good way to address the non-functional issues. Uh, thank you, Rong. I think, um, you know, uh, we talked about now how uh, we have to handle um, various uh, APIs and API services, and we can't move away from that. We need to create a fabric that allows people to collaborate. But at the end, end of the day, there has to be decisions being made as part of the processes. And that brings us to AI, right? AI and advanced analytics that's, um, uh, you know, uh, growing in adoption. Um, in, in the keynote, Catherine mentioned about how AI is getting accelerated, but still only one in 20 firms um, have really um, uh, adopted at anything at scale. So Emily, I mean, you know, you touched on a few things which we hugely important in this space. One is that most of the data, it's not necessarily in, in, in structured form. It's in unstructured form. Um, and, and a lot of the data today is being used, but it's being used by people who are pouring over it manually. 
So how would AI in finance help to automate some of that thing and augment the decision making? How do you see it? Okay, um, yeah, I just want to discuss maybe from my perspective, but I know this AI has been broadly used in the financial services. Um, I just want to talk more from the unstructured data perspective. Um, I think it, probably you, it's real known that like people can use the news right to predict the stock movement based on the sentiment of the tweets or the news. Then um, I think recently there's another application um, deployed by SEC. So basically they applied um, a classical algorithm called the LDA. So if you are in the field of tax mining, probably in the LDA very well, it's called the latent division allocation. It has been invented a long time ago, but recently I think the SEC deployed the application in this area. So basically they analyzed the financial disclosure. Um, then they found that actually if the form actually was charged by misconduct, like financial misconduct, they tried to play down a specific topic related to performance discussion. So basically they tried to avoid um, discussing about like the real risk or performance. So that's our application actually um, deployed the SEC. And uh, in the research area actually there are, I think there are hundreds of studies in this area. So basically around this textual analysis, basically wanted to analyze the corporate, like the, the stock moment, was the any fraudulent activities going on. Um, I think there's a really recent application where maybe study in this area, it's called the lazy prices. Um, I think the, it's really interesting. So for example, if a form, because every year, at least in the United States, public form has to file this kind of like disclosure. But um, it actually it takes time because each disclosure contains maybe 100 key words. So usually a form just uh, use a template. If the business is usual, they just fill the numbers, do a very minor change. Now, if there's something unusual happens, the performance declined, or maybe some fraudulent activity goes on, then they have to make a dramatic change in the text. So now a group of, of um, economists actually, they found that if you just compare the, the difference between two consecutive like um, financial disclosure of a form, you just use the difference as an indicator, actually you can predict a number of things. So that's the name called the lazy prices because it's likely, to, it's easy to get lazy, but there's a price behind that. So this difference actually can predict the stock moment. So if you see dramatic change, then maybe because the stock either goes up or goes down, and it's, the correlation is really significant. And also they can predict like the financial misconduct. Um, so that's another interesting funding or the application of this area. Um, another thing I think, is, another thing I just wanted to emphasize is that in this area, because a lot of researchers typically in the financial or in the finance or the accounting or the economics area, so they really need help in the NLP techniques. So, so far the techniques they use are really simple. For, for example, they just uh, uh, count like the words, so how many words in this uh, financial disclosure, where well, they just can't like the calculus, the sentiment, etc. But even that, actually, the the indicators or the uh, the variables extracted from the text also very significant. As another example, say for example, the another study found that um, there's a high correlation between number of words and also the misconduct. So why is that? So if now, if the business is usual, right, they probably don't spend a lot, uh, use a lot of words to, in their financial disclosure. But if there's something going on, you want to cover up or explain your business, then it's much, much longer. So even the lens actually has a high correlation between the business, the activities going on. And uh, the sentiment actually is another issue because sometimes it's not that effective, although we heard a lot about the sentiment, but. So recently they found that the sentiment is not very really significant because it's easy to say in one point, you make it a highly positive, another point, negative. Then you, if you just add them up, it's neutral, so it's not that effective. So that's the area they need a lot of help. I think so if you are in the area, of, especially NLP, I think that's maybe a good area for you to explore because we do have rich data set 
like say, for deep learning, especially for the prediction, we won't have X and Y. So X can be like a large data set, and the Y can be all kinds of like business, uh, like the events, although those events are real, for example, the inside the trading, the bankruptcy, those are the events probably you can predict. Yeah. Okay, um, so I'm glad you touched on some of these um, interesting examples. I mean, financial services is fascinating when it comes to the number of uh, um, interesting problems that you can go after, um, especially with an R&D mindset. It's a good domain to be in, and I'm glad that Emily touched on that. But that also brings me a very quick question, both to you and to Ore as well. One of the important challenges as we think through this entire notion of bringing in more and more intelligence that takes advantage of uh, you know, computing gains as well as algorithmic gains and, and with more access to data, et cetera. Um, you know, there's a sh real serious shortage of talent in this space. So uh, from an academic perspective, and I know, Ore, you've been on both sides, academia and industry. I want Emily and then you also to quickly touch on this as to what are some of the things that uh, can be done in terms of industry academia partnership as well as academia addressing the shortage. Okay, so um, let me let me let me give you the story in a few words, right? For every competence that I know of, the work that you need to do is highly specialized in financial services to that competence, no matter what modeling you try to do. And the common denominator, I mean, it's not that, I mean, it's not that we are stupid, right? I mean, I'm, I'm we, we, the reason we don't know, right, is because we never saw the data. Let me give you some examples. How many of us know the pattern of the wealth management transactions that somebody in any of the typical clusters of wealth management customers do. Do you know the type of series that they are? I mean, a recommendation engine in Netflix, right, or in Amazon to buy the next book. Yeah, these are very low risk assessments, right? When you approach a wealth management customer and the embeddedness of the behavior, process and data cannot be separated. It's very nice to think about the perfect world in which footprints are the ultimate fact and the only fact. But reality is not like that, right? Reality is much deeper, right? Provenance of data is the key of the cognitive functions that need to be recovered. It's not just the footprint. Right? So scalability, which is part of the concern that you are asking me, right? Is yeah, no, but you bring up a deeper point. I mean, there's, if you look at all the journals, there is no dearth of AI papers. In fact, you can't even keep up with them. There's so many of these AI papers. But at least from our financial services lens, I contend that there is a growing gap between, in many ways, between academia and industry as to where the industry is seeing the real problems and are they really being addressed, right? So that's one of the things that goes back to what Ore was touching on. There's a lot more complexity when it's not simply taking data, running it through some models and spitting out the results, right? Because we know, and, and, and Michael touched on this and many others touched on it as well, there's, it's a heavily regulated industry. So even if, an, if a model, you don't know how to explain it, it works very well, you can't actually put it out there. So therefore it requires deeper learning. It goes back to the notions of explainability and how do you interpret that. And that again would influence how you architect these systems. And you heard that in the talk right at the beginning, right in the keynote. So how best to use the computing and the model. So it's an excellent point. But I, I didn't want to forget the, the future as well in terms of quantum. And, and, and so, Ricardo, I think, you know, uh, quantum is real, right? I mean, we have uh, quantum hardware now. Um, there are multiple companies providing that. I know from IBM, uh, Catherine touched on it. Um, we have, um, you know, a few systems which are in public with five qubits and 16 qubits and 
20 qubits, if you're part of the Q network, et cetera. Um, we also know that there's a lot of open source. So you can actually run stuff in a simulator in a classical computer as well as run it on real hardware. In fact, we are seeing more experiments being done on real hardware as opposed to the simulators. Uh, but then you have been looking at how you, know, how you can apply some of these emerging capabilities in financial services and, and the class of optimization problem that you're looking at. What are some of those things which you think um, have early good promise? What sort of problems? depends a lot on the type of technology you are willing to adopt, which is uh, kind of funny, but uh, the promise and the goal is to get what IBM is, is moving towards, to have like a universal computer that can show like a quantum computer. Uh, in the meanwhile, what we have is, okay, we have uh, the quantum machine, the IBM quantum machine, but we have other companies, which actually they are doing some specialized uh, analog computers that somehow exploit the uh, quantum uh, uh, theory. And actually the, the, the scalability of some of these machines is quite questionable, like uh, because of the way they are, they are built. So, but they can usually solve very specific problems. Okay? So many of these machines, they're focused on solving uh, optimization problems. I mean, like uh, one of the big ones is D-Wave uh, in, in Canada. So, for, for this machine in particular, we can definitely consider very difficult problems and pose in, in, the, in the one problem that this machine can solve. And, uh, and in a way, it's, it's interesting because we can take uh, a lot of our previous work on, on say, in my case, for quality optimization, uh, and we can just rephrase the problem and pose it as one of these, and this machine is already can manage big enough uh, sizes of, of, of problems that, that it makes sense to consider. Now, uh, moving towards the future, uh, from a point of view uh, being mostly from optimization, I, I think that definitely quantum computer will play a role in solving and being able to even consider very difficult uh, interior optimization problems. Uh, right now, since the 60s and 70s, uh, we can solve uh, linear programs and nonlinear programs with continuous variables of immense size. And a lot of, uh, of what we can achieve now is due to this fact that we can solve these difficult problems. But now that's almost, I mean, I don't want to say trivial, but we do this at scale, at big scale, and in milliseconds or, or so. Now, when we talk about so solving interior optimization problems, mm, uh, from, for example, it, it is very diffi different if we are trying to solve a, a, a portfolio problem where you're saying, oh, let me just divide my wealth across evenly, let's say, not evenly, but uh, continuously across these stocks or assets, whatever. It's very difficult if you start saying, no, I don't want to do it. I cannot divide this uh, even uh, continuously. I have to do it integer, so I can only buy so many of these integer values. And so this problem becomes like the, the, the difficulty of the problem is completely different. Uh, the continuous problem, easy, the, the interior problem is very difficult, and to move it at scale is almost, it's not impossible, but it's too hard. Now, quantum computers actually, because of the nature of, of, of uh, quantum phenomena, actually, that's a, one of the biggest things that they promise, is that it will allow us to consider these difficult problems, which event, actually, at the end, all the methods that we have is a very clever way of counting all the possibilities. There are not infinitely, infinitely many possibilities, they are finitely, but there are many, this finite number is huge, Quantum computers, because of, of the quantum phenomena, can consider all of these almost simultaneously and just tell, show us, okay, this is the best. Mm. So this kind of problem, we will be able to, to actually get a lot from it. Uh, and and the, the promise is, is basically going from a problem that might take, not hours, it could be months to solve. I have worked with such problems. I, 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 I solve problems. Uh, interior optimization problems where you develop a, a nice algorithm and you have to let it run for a month, say, and then you get the solution. Well, if we had a quantum computer that could manage the scale, it should be done in almost immediately. And that's, yep. that's kind of like the, the, the promise. And then we could, we could have services that actually could, could offer this solution. Mm -hmm. And that's why I mentioned the counterparty risk, uh, which is actually a better example than the portfolio optimization because counterparty risk 
when you consider these type of problems, actually they become a huge interior optimization problems where you're considering interactions with other people and what others are doing. And you want to have your graph of interactions as big as possible, but that creates a exponentially grows the size of the problem. So one more is yeah. where do you and Ricardo, it's a great opportunity also for the industry and academia to collaborate in this space because we are very early in in um, in the quantum space, especially in applying it to finance. Yeah. But there's strong interest that's emerging that we notice from various financial services companies to look at that. And for those of you who are interested in exploring quantum, there are multiple software platforms out there. There's one from IBM called QIS Kit, which you can go look up. There's also other ones, uh, like Project Q from ETH Zurich. There is one uh, uh, which is called PyQuill, uh, which is from Rigetti. Um, and then there's another one called Q Sharp. Some of them only have simulators underneath them. They don't have the real uh, quantum hardware. Some do. So there's a variety now. So that's how these things evolve. And, and clearly, uh, financial services can take advantage of that. I know we, um, uh, we would love to have more things um, be explored. It's a big space. We wanted to paint a broad picture for all of you as this is our first financial services forum um, symposium. Uh, I actually want to thank all our panelists for providing their perspective, uh, both not just the rosy picture, but also the, the practical difficulties and the challenges we have to uh, go after to have real impact and uh, look at pathways to impact, right? And there are many pathways to impact, as you can see, from various points in the stack, if you want to think in software terms as well. Right? So I want to thank uh, all the panelists. And what we heard were, you know, just so that uh, you, you, know, you might uh, have picked up on these themes, uh, we talked about new models of trust. Um, these are the new data marketplaces Christoph touched on. Um, Natalie talked about, you know, how blockchains uh, can be promising, uh, but you know there are some business model issues that need to be addressed. We talked about smarter infrastructure that have to include APIs as well as rec tech, because many of these things are cross-jurisdictional. They cut across many different uh, value chains, so you would have to address a smarter infrastructure that handles regulations and compliance as well. We touched briefly, though, in AI and finance. You heard a lot about AI, of course, at the very beginning in the keynote as well. AI will remain a very important area uh, for us to uh, go after in finance. Um, and again, uh, you have to look at it as um, wrong reminder as data plus AI. Uh, you know, you need to have an information architecture in order to leverage AI. And, and Orhe had cautioned us that, uh, you know, you've got to be worried about the legal aspects of these things as to where you can apply them and how you can use them. And that is very particular to the two industries that IEEE is focused on, health and finance. Those are very, uh, very regulated industries, and one has to be uh, looking at the ethical aspects of AI, which we did not cover here. And then there is a security dimension of AI for which there are other panel discussions I know to, that's happening tomorrow, which will get covered in there as well. Right? And finally, the future of computing, and, and, and Catherine said it very eloquently. Uh, for financial services, um, many of the transaction pr processing platforms we talked about, they're all about scale, and, and they're also about being smart in processing these things. And they are the bulwark of the financial services industry. So the future of computing, whatever the new architectures are, it's going to find a place first in the financial services industry, as many of our beliefs, right? So with that, let me end the uh, uh, panel. Thank you very much.